Hi guys, Mr. Pulley here for History of Western Civilization at Fieldcrest, looking at uh, Chapter 17, uh, The American Revolution, Causes and Effects. This might be a long one. I'll try to go fast, do my best John Green impersonation, but I can't guarantee everything. So here we go. So here at the British colonies in 1750, you can see we've got the New England colonies up north, uh, followed by the middle colonies, uh, New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, uh, those areas, Delaware. Uh, then the Chesapeake uh, colonies, which is basically uh, Maryland and Virginia, and what is today West Virginia. Then the southern colonies uh, in the southern areas, North Carolina on south into Georgia. Now these colonies are, are very different. They don't quite exactly all get along. Each is a separate entity, all with their own uh, charter from the king. Uh, they each have their own government, a legislature uh, and a governor. The governor is appointed by the king, but he's paid by the legislature, so he's between a rock and a hard place. Got to do what the king tells me, but I can't make the legislature mad because they won't pay me. Okay, a bit of an issue there. Uh, there are few intercolony ties except for some trade. Most of that trade is supposed to go back through England. And it's the French and Indian War, as we talked about the Seven Years' War, that will serve to loosely unite these colonies, which in the end will be a good thing for the British in the Seven Years' War, but a bad thing for them later on. Okay, there's also rapid population growth that occurs in the colonies from 1700 to 1770. Let's take a look at that. In 1700, about 25, excuse me, 250,000 colonists, a quarter of a million colonists, okay? By 1750, that had become two and a half million, a tenfold increasing. We know what John would say about that. Of course, some folks are immigrating in as well. Don't forget that. Okay, uh, in uh, 1700, there were 20 British citizens for each colonist. By 1770, there were only three British citizens for each colonist. So a little bit of a depopulation on the British side with people coming over and a huge increase of people in the colonies. Okay, trade and things during the French and Indian War. Well, this is a trade conflict essentially between the British and the French uh, along the borders and involved Native Americans on both sides. Uh, most of them fighting, the Native Americans fighting with the French because they saw the French as not wanting to take their land and being trade partners as opposed to the English coming in and taking over land and keeping it forever. Uh, Iroquois is probably the notable exception who fight on the British side. Okay, after the French and Indian War, we had a situation where the colonists were still combined in this area over here or forced to stay in this area uh, over here in the dark pink. But the British colonies now included all this lighter pink area all the way to the Mississippi River. But there's a problem. Uh, the trade with the colonies had made England wealthy, but the war had resulted in debt. And England ended this policy of what was referred to as salutary neglect. Now, before the French and Indian War, the colonists were smuggling goods and avoiding paying taxes on stuff for the British. And that was relatively okay with England because they were still making a lot of money off the colonies. But when they needed money, they put an end to that and tried to crack down on all the money that's seeping through the cracks, so to speak. Well, the colonists had developed a nearly independent economy and political system. And with the proclamation of 1763 after the Seven Years' War, the French and Indian War here in the uh, in Americas, uh, they were told to stay east of the Appalachians when they thought they had been fighting with the British in order to be able to move west of the Appalachians. So not happy about that. And not only that, uh, taxes that the British had enforced before, well, they're going to start enforcing those, including the Molasses Act. And they passed a Sugar Act in 1764 to... Uh, be enforced much more strictly. These things don't meet uh, much uh, agreement with the colonists because they are being taxed and have no say in their being taxed. Okay, now tension between the Britons and the colonists, well, here are the sort of problems, okay? First of all, we got British troops along the western frontier, so you don't move west into the area we told you not to in the proclamation of 1763. That proclamation line limits that westward expansion, and we have these greater taxes for war debt. So British troops, this is a problem because these troops are seen as a threat to our activities and freedom. Uh, not only that, they're staying in our houses, and not only that, they're taking our part-time jobs, okay? The proclamation line, uh, angers colonists who ignore it and move west anyway and paying taxes this is that whole idea of taxation without representation hey king says that's for english citizens except for those living in colonies 
Now, English common law was sort of the law of the land. Was that there's basically can be no arbitrary acts by the government. And this is what the colonists kind of saw what the king was doing. Now, realize the king is getting these laws passed through parliament. So it's not just the king, it's parliament as well. Okay, we also got uh, the Enlightenment with this new ways of thinking uh, have entered our minds. Uh, John Locke and his natural rights of life, liberty, and property. And we'd also had the English Whigs who had limited the king during the 1689 Glorious Revolution. Uh, that idea of limiting uh, what the king's rights were when they brought in William and Mary. Okay. The Stamp Act creates a bit of a crisis uh, in the colonies. Uh, These are protests and uh, boycotts. Uh, the, the tax collectors are forced to uh, resign. Uh, and the colonists, for the most part, even prevent the distribution of the actual stamps themselves. Now, this was to be a, a tax uh, on uh, all uh, pieces of paper, uh, deeds, marriage certificates, birth certificates, anything like that that had to be stamped uh, and a, a tax paid on that. Pressure from British merchants leads to the Prime Minister to call for a repeal of the Stamp Act. However, they issue the Declaratory Act saying, uh, you may have won this one, but we still have the right to legislate and tax you, whether you have representation or not. So they pass a series of acts, uh, including the Townsend Act here. This again leads to protests and boycotts. Uh, this was on paint, glass, lead, and most importantly, tea, because tea was like the Monster, Mountain Dew, Coke, Pepsi, everything else all rolled into one. Uh, in fact, John Hancock's ship, The Liberty, is seized, probably because he's smuggling, uh, but that he's the founder of the Sons of Liberty, and so that he makes his case very strongly felt against that. Um, there's pressure, pressure on the British to enforce the tax, plus instead of having courts where other colonists hear your case and say, oh, I'm sure he's not guilty. We now have naval officer, officers arresting you and naval officers trying you and naval officers convicting you. And there's a bit of uh, an incentive for them because they get a cut if you're found guilty. Okay. We see riots against custom agents and the British troop level gets increased. We have about 4,000 troops uh, in Boston, uh, literally a one troop for every four citizens ratio which then is going to escalate tensions and lead to what is famously referred to, especially by um, Paul Revere, as the Boston Massacre. Now, really, people go back and look, this is really more of a street brawl or a small riot. Uh, we got only about half a dozen or so uh, British soldiers uh, out on guard duty. A guy calls out his, some of his friends to help out. He's being pelted by ice balls and threatened by guys with clubs and sticks uh, who are drunk coming home from the bars, yelling at him. Um, someone accidentally fired and five colonists are killed and uh, well if you want to start a revolution uh, you don't call it the Boston riot you call it the Boston massacre uh, anyway the result of this is colonial assemblies are set up uh, they set up what they call committees of correspondence where the communities the colonies are now writing to each other and keeping track of the news and trying to hear it from the side of the colonists versus hearing it filtered through the British uh, and this will lead to the Boston Tea Party where 15,000 pounds of tea are destroyed. And after this tea party where our guys dressed up as Indians, and of course looks like Indians like I would if I was dressed in more paint and feathers, uh, the British shut down um, Boston basically, imposed martial law. Uh, the harbor is closed. It was in fact the busiest harbor in the Americas. Uh, and that distinction then will go to New York and remain that way. We will see the first Continental Congress issue a Declaration of Colonial Rights uh, based upon the English rights, uh, but not much will come of that. Uh, but they did say that if the British use force, the colonists can defend themselves. Now, the goal of any tax is to raise money, right? Well, this didn't quite work out for the British. They hoped to raise 2.1 million pounds. However, they brought in 330,000 pounds, but with expenses of 3.75 million pounds, this is a total loss of 3.42 million pounds. Not a good call, guys. Eventually, we'll lead to the, the battles that are the start of the uh, American Revolution as we 
traditionally think of it, the Battles of Lexington and Concord. Uh, we're not sure who fired first. Uh, some say a colonist fired and the British respond in kind, or the British threatened to sh fire and, at them first. And at any rate, uh, the colonists don't do so well. Uh, eight are killed at Lexington, nine are wounded. Uh, the troops then go on to Concord. Uh, their goal is to capture a stash of uh, weapons that the colonists supposedly had there. Uh, they find no troops or weapons when they get there, forewarning. Okay. On the way back, they are sniping by colonists uh, who are hiding in places that kills dozens of British on their retreat back to Boston. Uh, the British end up being safe, but the colonists have organized themselves, and now Boston is surrounded with the British troops inside of it. Okay, so independence or not? Well, we have a second Continental Congress who debates, do we want peace or war? Uh, the British move on the militiamen who are on Breed's Hill, actually near Bunker Hill, although we call it the Battle of Bunker Hill, uh, you know, cartographer's mistake. Uh, at any rate, um, the British drive off the colonists because the colonists have run out of ammunition, but they suffer a thousand casualties in doing so. Only 100 or 311 colonial casualties, of which uh, 140 are actually killed. Okay. Congress, still not sure we would actually want to have war. They offer an olive branch petition to the king, sort of a last ditch attempt to avoid war, which George III is going to say, too little, uh, too late. Okay, so independence it is. Uh, Thomas Paine, a Scotsman who's been living in the colonies for all of about three months when he writes a famous pamphlet, Common Sense, says it's Americans' destiny. Uh, freedom would uh, allow Americans to create a better society. Okay, and Jefferson uses Enlightenment ideas and John Locke's ideas to write the Declaration of Independence. And we end up with loyalists versus patriots. Well, okay, actually, we got loyalists loyal to the king, patriots over here, and a bunch of people in the middle kind of like, yeah, I'm kind of busy. Okay, let's take a quick break at this point. We'll split it here uh, and move on to the actual fighting of the war when we come back in part two of the American Revolution.